702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Good morning to you, Chris. Hey, good morning. Our science story of the week um, is a fascinating one that hopefully will have some upsides in terms of how we might approach the treatment of strokes. Let's hope so. So this is a paper in Science Translational Medicine by researchers at Washington University. That's near St. Louis, which is in America. And what they've done is to come up with a way to better treat stroke. Now, a stroke happens when we interrupt the flow of blood to the brain. The brain has a very high metabolic rate, and if you interrupt its blood supply, the nerve cells that are downstream of that interruption very quickly begin to die. And when they die off, you lose the function that those nerve cells would have provided for you. And different parts of the brain are specialised at doing different jobs. Therefore, the job that that part of the brain that's affected did is lost. Now, there is some opportunity for recovery, and if people are given rehabilitation therapy like physiotherapy, they can regain some of their lost function. And the brain does this by rewiring parts of itself. So the area that's been lost, some of its functions are taken over by adjacent brain areas, and some of the connections are rerouted, a bit like a telephone exchange, so that those adjacent brain areas can take over some of the lost function. But the outcomes can be quite variable, and they're limited at best. What these researchers in America have found is that if you actually take a mouse that's having a stroke and you shave off the whiskers on the opposite side of its face, so in other words, if the right side of the brain is having the stroke, the whiskers from the left side of the face are represented on the right side of the brain. If you shave those whiskers, the whiskers correspond to a part of the brain which sits right next door to the area which controls the forepaw and they were inducing a stroke in the area that controls the forepaw. They found when they did this that the mice that had the shaved whiskers moved the representation of their forepaw onto the patch of the brain that used to have inputs from the whiskers, and this meant that the ability of them to feel and control and use their forepaw correctly recovered much more quickly, and it recovered to a much greater extent, and the brain rewired use of the forepaw into this area, which used to receive input from the whiskers. And what the researchers speculate is that when you withdraw the sensory input from the whiskers, it encourages brain cells that have been deprived of some of their sensory input to encourage other nerve cells to connect to them. And this facilitates the formation of these new connections which enables the brain to better rewire itself. And so they're saying this might be a useful therapy in humans who've had strokes. We could do a temporary sensory deprivation where you'd stop them using a certain group of muscles or immobilise a limb in a certain way so that only certain groups of muscles, the affected muscles, could be used. And this would encourage the brain to rewire itself and, and the person would have a better outcome as they rehabilitate from their stroke. Johnny Santon, welcome to the show. Yes, hi, Chris. Um, I've been doing a few home experiments trying to extract salt from seawater. And uh, I took a pressure cooker with a, with a uh, I don't know what you call this, curved mirror. Focused the heat onto it, got to about 700 degrees, degrees Celsius. And I harvested the steam from that, which was fresh. But um, I got so little water out of it that it wasn't viable. My question is, is there any medium that you can actually filter seawater through to remove the salt, like bentonite or, or a similar product? Good morning. Well, this is a very important question, isn't it? Because, of course, many countries, uh, including Cape Town in South Africa, are facing water shortages and water crises. So this is a perennial problem. And the reason the sea is salty is that it's energetically difficult to get salt out of water once it's in there. And it takes a sun in the sky shining and uh, illuminating the surface of the sea to evaporate fresh water and give us the fresh water we have because that fresh water turns into rain that falls over land. So the answer is it's energetically very demanding doing this, which is why it costs a huge amount to do desalination. Now, researchers are looking for alternative uh, ways to do this, but there is no such thing in physics and chemistry as a free lunch. So you've got to put the energy in to break apart the bonds between the water molecules because there are bonds holding the molecules together, and that is what stops it easily turning into steam. And then you boil off the water, you collect the steam. One way of doing it is with desal by putting in electrical heating. Another way is to use the heat of the sun, which is what you've been trying to do. You can also light a fire. Uh, That doesn't do much for climate change, of course. And then people are doing things like uh, using a low vacuum. So if you drop the pressure right down, then water boils at a lower temperature. So you could use a vacuum pump and you could boil off the water that way and collect the steam. Uh, A bit more difficult to condense it that way, though you have to have a a more specialised rig. Um, But it's it's really tricky 
And then there are problems with uh, you know, maintaining the pressure and getting enough throughput and so on. People are also using reverse osmosis. This is where you have a membrane where you have the salty water on one side. You have very tiny holes in the membrane which are small enough to allow water molecules to go through but they won't allow the salt particles. And you apply pressure to that and you force through the fresh water. Problem is, again, it all takes energy and that's what the world is also short of. Okay, good stuff. Let's go to Bialville. Frida, good morning to you. Hello, good morning. I want to know when I buy bread that's been lying around, it's hard. And when I put it in a plastic bag, it gets soft suddenly. I, I tried it with a brown paper bag, but it didn't do the same. Oh, hello, Frida. When you have a loaf of bread and you bake it, then what happens to the bread in the oven is that it forms a nice thick crust around the outside of the loaf. This is relatively impervious to water moving through, so it keeps the bread nice and moist. But when you cut into the loaf to make either slices or you just cut one end off, then you expose the interior of the loaf so it's unprotected by the crust and therefore it starts to lose water and that's why the bread goes all hard. Now, at the same time, though, if you put the bread somewhere where you stop the bread losing water, and a plastic bag is a good choice of doing that, you're, you're replacing the function of the crust so that the water can no longer leave the bread. If you make the bread slightly damp before you put it in the bag, or you use humid air and you trap a layer of air in with the bread in the bag, then it will stop the bread going any drier, so it will stay nice and floppy. That's why your sandwiches stay fresh if you put them in a plastic bag, but if you leave them in a, in a paper bag, eventually they're going to dry out. There's no way that the bread will get new water, though, unless something else like fungi or something are in there eating the bread and breaking down the starch and releasing water. So I don't know why the bread would go from very hard and dry to being wet again. I suspect there was maybe some dampness or moisture in the bag, or as I say, it's it's turning into a microbial banquet, which is releasing water from chemicals. Um, but I think that's unlikely. I think it would look pretty horrible by that stage. So it's more likely it, 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 putting it in a bag stopped it drying out so much in the first place. Mandy, good morning to you. What is your question? Hello, is that me? Yes. Mandy, yes. Um, about eight years ago, I made a batch of ginger beer, put it all in plastic bottles. But what was left, I put in a glass bottle and I put that in my cellar. And now I'm scared to open the glass bottle because you know how explosive ginger beer can be. I want to know how long does it go on having that, how long does it go on fermenting and, and how long would it be explosive for? Hello Mandy, good morning. The reason that ginger beer is explosive is because when you put the sugars with the yeast, if you're putting yeast into it, then or you put various uh, things like fruits and things in there which have got yeast on them, they consume the sugars and the sugars are converted into carbon dioxide. And the reason it gets fizzy is because the carbon dioxide cannot escape because you seal the bottle and therefore the carbon dioxide is driven into solution. Effectively, it prizes its way between the water molecules. It can't get out and this puts the pressure up in the bottle. Now, unless you let the pressure off, then the pressure is there. So there's always going to be pressure in the bottle and it will go pop if you release the cork suddenly. The best way to open these things is to degas them gently. So in other words, gently open the top and just let the pressure off very slowly. What this will do is prevent the gas all trying to escape at once because the reason it all comes flying out of the top of a bottle when you do this is that if you release the pressure all at once, some bubbles form in the bottle because of the low pressure. And once you've got one set of bubbles formed, other bubbles find it much easier to form on the existing bubbles. So the existing bubbles then become enormously bigger all at once, and they do it underneath all of the liquid that's in the bottle. The gas takes up maybe 500 to 1,000 times more space than the liquid does, and this, of course, means there's not enough room in the bottle for all the liquid, so it forces all of the liquid outwards, and the only way it can go is out of the neck of the bottle, which is why it explodes everywhere. Whereas if you let the pressure off very gently, you slow down that process at which the big bubbles can form and you give the small bubbles time to get out through the column of liquid to the top before more bubbles begin to form and then it doesn't explode all over you. I hope it tastes nice though. This is very, this is very bad news, Chris, because I don't <laughs> have a screw top. I have a clip on top with a rubber ring. So I think I'm going to have to get bomb disposal, don't you? <laughs> well, it might be a good idea, but why not take it out into the garden? Because when we do our science experiments and, and do things that use this principle, we always go outside. We take a, a sort of 
a, a, a Mac, a plastic Mac, and put some plastic on the ground because uh, it can get messy. Watch your eyes, though, because um, sometimes the, the top of the bottle can detach with the pressure being released and it can f- come out into your face, especially it's tempting when you, you want to see what you're doing. You put your face right over the top of the bottle. At best, you may get a mouthful of ginger beer. At worst, you may get an eyeful of the lid. So just be very careful. <laughs> All the best, Mandy. Mark in Tableview, what question have you got for us? Morning, Chris. Um, it's a question relating to hose pipes and water. Um, I shouldn't be asking this question now that we're in the middle of a drought, but it's something that's always intrigued me. Um, if you turn on a hose pipe and the, and the water's coming out relatively fast, is a reactionary force on the hose pipe that pushes the hose pipe back towards you? Now, if you take the same hose pipe and you put the tip of the hose pipe under water, say, for example, into a pool or into a pond or into a bucket, that force suddenly reduces by, by quite, quite a lot. What is the reason for that? Good morning. With another excellent question, this is Isaac Newton's third law, which is for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you push on the water coming out of the hose pipe, it pushes back on you and gives you a thrust in the other direction. It's also Isaac Newton's second law, which is F, force, equals M, mass times A, acceleration. So in other words, the force you feel, F, is equal to the mass of the water that you're accelerating and so hence you feel a force back in the other direction. Now when you spray the hose just out into the air the water is issuing from the hose and it is issuing at the rate of whatever the flow rate is and therefore the mass of water that you're throwing out of the hose is applying a force back on you. If you put the hose underwater there's still the same effect going on. It is water pushing out from the hose pushing water molecules out of the way under the water of the pool. What you won't notice, or what what you will find though, is that there will be some retard, it'll be harder for the water to leave the hose because it's hitting other water molecules, so the flow rate might be a little bit lower. Also, you're probably not uh, holding the hose at the same angle that you would when you put it uh, into the against a wall for example you're probably holding it vertically and that means that the water is then doing work against gravity up the hose Um, so in other words it's easier for you to hold that segment of hose because you're probably doing it vertically if you were to do it horizontally I don't think you'd feel very much difference there'd be a minor reduction because as I say it's harder for the water to issue because it's hitting other water in the in the pool which has got to push out of the way so it will come out a little bit slower and that will put more back pressure back down the pipe but on the whole I think the reason is possibly the uh, attitude you're holding the pipe out. But if anyone has a better theory, please do tell us. Thanks for your question, Mark. Fascinating one. Let's go to Fish Hook. Claire, good morning and thank you for holding on. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Um, this might sound like a weird question. I know of a snake having been perf- not damaged at all, perfectly alive, put in a deep freezer at minus 23 degrees Celsius. Um, after it was taken out a couple of weeks, we spent a couple of weeks like that, after being taken out and left in the sun, a couple of hours later, it was slithering all over the place. Now, I'd like to know, you, the people who take rock lobster, often they take it from the sea, take it home and put it in the deep freeze. And the same sort of thing. Now, I'd like to know, if it spent a couple of weeks in the deep freezer and you take it out and it thaws, will it come alive again? <laughs> Interesting question. There are, of course, animals that do do this, and there are frogs and other amphibians that have evolved to freeze. And the way they do it is they have chemicals in their cells that make their cells freeze very well. And you might say that sounds counterintuitive. Surely they would want antifreeze, but they don't. They have chemicals in their cells that encourage the formation of ice crystals, and they do it so that they freeze very quickly, because by making their cells freeze quickly, there isn't time for the cells to swell up and burst. Now, why that happens is, and this is why when you freeze food, or normally you freeze most animals, that they will be killed by the process. This is because when a cell forms some ice, the ice that forms is fresh water only. So the water that's left in the cell contains more salt. And that increased concentration of salt pulls more water into the tissue from the body fluids and that makes the tissue swell. And then you form more ice, which leaves a more concentrated salt solution, so it pulls more water into the cell. And this is what bursts the cells apart and ruptures the tissue, and that's why strawberries never look the same after they've been through the freezer. Now, the animals that have evolved to do this, by making themselves freeze very quickly, they mean their cells don't have time to take on board water before they turn to ice, and they use other techniques to protect their tissues, 
when they're in this state of suspended animation, these animals are all cold-blooded as well, which means that their metabolism is driven by the external temperature. Now, there are some snakes that can also survive going down to very low temperatures. Things like the garter snakes, I think, can do this. There are snakes in Canada which are famous for being able to live in huge, great colonies and they steal warmth from each other when the sun begins to return and warm the land and, and they come back from being in the deep freeze, effectively, for a really long time. So it's, it's possible, although I've not heard cases of the one you're describing, that, that animals like snakes have adapted to survive and can do this. For animals like lobsters... Uh, I don't know whether or not they could survive being completely frozen. I doubt it because they have evolved to live in an environment where the temperature would not drop below the uh, temperature of about four degrees, maybe maybe close to zero at most, where, where they live. Very, very cold, but they have not adapted to have their tissues frozen. So I'd be very surprised if they can tolerate that because I, I think that they would be killed by the by the freezing. But if anyone, again, knows better, do tell me. Okay, some really good questions today. Let's go to Randberg. Stephen, what have you got for us? Yeah, hi. Um, it's the Roman numeral number four. It's represented as a, a one and an, uh, the I and a V as a standard. Why is it in watches and clocks that they, they use a non-standard Roman numeral that the number four is represented as four I's? And it just seems to be only that one place that it's, that, that it's mm. done. <laughs> Interesting. Any reason for that? <laughs> what an interesting observation. Do you know, it's one of those things that I've taken for granted and it's been right under my nose and right on my left wrist my entire life and I hadn't paid it any attention. Isn't that interesting? I think it's a, a, for reasons of aesthetics and space, probably. Uh, it, it's easy to represent four lines, one, two, three, four. It's harder to do the V. It probably uh, takes up a bit more space to do IV. And so by doing it with four lines the way they do, I, I suspect they do it for reasons of aesthetics. And then because one person did it and they thought it looked nice, then uh, everyone else decided to do that. It, it might also be that it's easier to see it and not muddle it up with the V next door. Because if you've got a uh, four and then a five and then a six and a seven, you haven't got two Vs next to each other, which might confuse some people. It might be harder to, to see what's going on, perhaps. I mean, that's my speculation. Mm. Thanks for that question, Stephen. Let's squeeze in one or two more. Gerard, good morning. What question do you want to put? Good morning, Eusebius. Um, my question is, when one goes to sleep, sometimes as you're drifting off, your body suddenly gives a massive jolt um, just as you're drifting off. What is that caused by? Hello, Gerard. You, ha uh, you are experiencing a hypnic jerk. Uh, what this is, is that as you go to sleep, your brain disengages its ability to control the muscles of the rest of your body. So there's a, the, there's a gate that closes on the flow of motor information coming out of your brain down into your spinal cord. This has evolved on purpose because you don't want to act out your dreams. You'd have a very restless night and thrash around and go sleepwalking and falling out of bed and maybe even jumping out of a window if you were to act on your dreams. So we are partially paralysed when we go to sleep at night. But as this system engages it can provoke these jerks and they are called hypnic jerks and they are usually a spasmic, sudden reflex contraction of uh, lots of muscle groups all at once which makes a, a whole body part, either a leg or an arm or, or sometimes both, move in a jerky way all of a sudden. And then as you wake up again, it disengages and you're able to freely move. But there are some people who experience something called sleep paralysis where this system doesn't automatically switch off every time perfectly and so sometimes they wake up and they are paralysed and they cannot move and it's very scary for them and then suddenly it turns off and they can, they can move again. Final question. We've got one minute left. This question comes from Tara. Oh, hello. Um, so my question is, I was playing with my cat yesterday and we were playing a game of marbles in the hallway and then I picked up one of the marbles that my cat had carelessly strewn across the stairway <laughs> and I looked inside it and they've, it, all the marbles have a little bit of a stripe inside and I was just wondering, how did they get the stripe inside the marble? Uh, what's the cat's name? The cat's name is Olive. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way which you do this, those marbles are made of glass. And the uh, way in which they put the stripe in there, a bit like the toothpaste really, you make a blob of molten glass and you then put on top of it a glass which has got some other pigment or a coloured mineral in it and drag it across the surface or drag it through it to introduce this... Um, shape or stripe or a whirl and then you fashion your nice piece of glass blob into a nice round circle that's the usual way of doing it
Thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you, Chris. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, we'll chat again next week, Friday. Thanks, Eusebius. Have a good day and a good weekend, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.